Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and if it sounds like I'm talking a little funny today, it's because I just got clear braces and my teeth hurt. I'm Katie, and if I sound like I'm talking a little funny today, I have no excuse whatsoever. Seriously, though, I had to take them out to record this or I'd be like, seriously, guys, welcome to Just Keep Rolling. (laughs) I'm your host, Ellen. Let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. At least there's not a lot of S's in that part, but still. Yeah. That's what I'd sound like. Yeah, I'm glad you took them out for this. I don't think I could keep a straight face. (laughs) But speaking of the rolling rehash, let's do it. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 6, Talons and Tea Leaves, and its corresponding film scenes. Neville taught everyone how to not open a book. Hermione taught the audience how to poorly steal lines. Ron taught Harry to pay attention to his surroundings. Hagrid taught his first class how to maybe, possibly not get maimed. Harry taught everyone that he is king of the world! And Malfoy got straight up schooled by a horsey bird. During episode 45, Horsey Bird, we had two Potter ponderings. The first one was, as we learned from last week's trivia question, Ron and Hermione practiced on the chestnut hippogriff. What do you think its name was? Carly thinks that it should be named Brownie, Tiramisu, or Chester. (laughs) Quincy says, according to his research, he, she may be Stormswift, Fleetwing, or Hot Hoof but that he personally would have gone with chocolate, since everybody loves chocolate. I'm with you, Quincy, especially if it comes from Lupin. (laughs) Storm Swift, Fleetwing, and Hot Hoof all do fit in with names like Buckbeak and Witherwings, so that would make sense. True. Dave suggests Hippographimus, or Hippie for short. That's an interesting one. Okay. Diana thinks his name should be Norman, which I like. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Max shows off his Slytherin side, suggesting kick mouth or karate jaw. Okay, but, but how are those Slytherin names that, like, those sound more like Gryffindor names, if I'm being honest, because, like, Gryffindors are like, kick the door in, ask questions later and shit. But the kick mouth or karate jaw are more violent. And let's be honest, so... Slytherin's totally violent when playing Quidditch. Okay, but are you telling me Gryffindors aren't violent? Not as bad as Slytherin. Oh, we fighting now. We fighting. Jackson suggested the name Red Claw because of the reddish color of chestnut horses. These were definitely some really good names. The mm-hmm. next time I need to name an animal, I'm taking a poll. <laughs> Our other Potter pondering was about the book to movie difference in Hagrid's reaction to Malfoy being injured in his class. Carly says, ugh, at the difference in reactions because she loves how Hagrid acts in the book. He's calm because he knows Malfoy is a fucking moron and did something wrong, and ultimately that's what led him to being attacked. Him and the movies are so panicky and freaked, and the book was so much better for Hagrid's response. Jackson agrees with her and says that he fully agrees that it was stupid how the films make Hagrid look dumb. But he actually does think his reaction in the film makes some sense. It's his first time teaching, he's nervous and excited. So it's natural he'd panic a little when a kid gets slashed by Buckbeak's talons, even though Malfoy did it on purpose. He does think the book version was better, but that it makes sense for Hagrid to be panicking a bit. Quincy thinks that Malfoy is a little bitch boy, and he thinks that how Hagrid handled it in the books is better. It shows Hagrid knows how to take charge. Like, why the fuck are the movies so hell-bent on making Hagrid look like a buffoon? Hagrid is definitely irresponsible, but he was made teacher for a reason. Because he knows how to maneuver in a sticky situation. And he isn't stupid. Prisoner of Azkaban and Goblet of Fire movies are stupid. He says, I said what I said, and it bears repeating, fuck Draco Malfoy. And once again, Quincy does not hold back. No. (laughs) But I'd even go as far as to say that those weren't the only movies that made Hagrid look stupid. Not at all. Like I said before, even in the first film, they had him be unable to spell happy birthday. Yeah. 
I'm also sure we'll see more things like that as we continue on our journey comparing the books to the films. Yep, and thanks again for all your responses. Let's move on to our trivia question, which was, what is the potion they were working on when Snape makes Ron and Harry help Malfoy prep his ingredients because of his injured arm? Congratulations again goes to Max Nash, who values winning more than sleeping. (laughs) Dave was three minutes behind him with the answer, wondering how Max was getting the episode several minutes before him. Max has some good advice for all who wish to access the episode as early as possible, saying that the app is evil. Go straight to the website at 11 Eastern Standard Time. Which really is probably the best advice, since it posts there first and then is sent out to everywhere else. Though Quincy just thinks that Dave is making excuses. Excuses, excuses. Thanks for playing along and always giving us fun and interesting Mm. banter to read when a new episode posts. Yep. And speaking of new episodes, let's keep rolling right into Chapter 7, The Boggart in the Wardrobe, and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 7, The Boggart in the Wardrobe Malfoy does not return to classes until late Thursday morning, with his arm all bandaged up about halfway through a double potions class. They are working on a shrinking solution, and Malfoy sets his cauldron up right next to Harry and Ron so that he can get Snape to make them help him prepare his ingredients. Ron chops his daisy root so roughly that Snape makes him trade with Malfoy, and Harry has to skin his shrivel fig. The whole time, Malfoy taunts them about how Hagrid isn't going to be a teacher much longer, and pretends like his arm has been seriously damaged. While all this is happening... Neville is having a harder time than usual. His potion is supposed to be bright green, but is orange instead. Snape is loudly shaming him in front of the whole class, and Neville is near tears. Hermione offers to help Neville fix it, and Snape tells her not to show off and lets Neville know that at the end of class they will test his potion on his toad to see if that encourages him to do it properly. As Snape walks away, he begs Hermione for help. Seamus mentions that the Daily Prophet reported a serious black sighting not far from Hogwarts, and Malfoy overhears, asking Harry if he's planning on trying to catch black single-handed. He goes on to say that if it was him, he'd have done something sooner and be out there looking for him because he'd want revenge. Harry and Ron don't know what he's talking about, but before they can get any more information out of him, Snape calls the class back to attention to tell them to clean up let their potion simmer, and then they can test Longbottom's potion. Hermione is muttering directions to Neville out of the corner of her mouth so Snape doesn't notice. Harry wonders what Malfoy was talking about as they all clear up their ingredients, and Ron thinks he just wants Harry to do something stupid. At the end of class, Snape gathers everyone around and Neville picks up his toad, Trevor. He trickles a couple of drops of the potion, which is now green, down the toad's throat, and Trevor turns into a tadpole. The Gryffindors clap and Snape pulls a bottle from his robes to return Trevor to a toad before taking five points from Gryffindor since he told Hermione not to help him. As they are leaving class, Ron asks Hermione why she didn't lie, but she doesn't answer. They are at the top of the stairs now and look around, but can't find her until they see her at the bottom of the stairs, panting and tucking something down her robes. As she is trying to explain that she had to go back for something, her bag splits at the seam and a dozen large and heavy books tumble out. Ron asks why she's carrying all of them, since they only have defense against the dark arts that afternoon, but Hermione changes the subject, asking about lunch before heading off to the Great Hall. When they arrive at their first defense against the dark arts class after lunch, Professor Lupin isn't there yet. They all sit down, take out their books, quills, and parchment, and wait for him to arrive. When Lupin does show up, he tells them to put their books away that they will only need their wands, and asks them to follow him. As he leads them through the corridor, they run into Peeves, who is stuffing gum into a keyhole and calls Lupin Loony Loopy Lupin. While still smiling, Lupin tells Peeves to take the gum out of the keyhole, but Peeves just blows a raspberry at him. Lupin sighs and takes out his wand, saying Wadi Wasi and pointing it at Peeves. The gum flies out of the keyhole and into Peeves' nostril, causing him to zoom away cursing. Dean says, cool, sir, and they all set off again until they reach the staff room. Lupin directs them all inside. 
The room is empty except for Snape, who tells Lupin to leave the door open, since he'd rather not witness this. He also warns him that the class contains Neville Longbottom, and advises him not to trust him with anything difficult, unless Miss Granger is hissing instructions in his ear. Professor Lupin raises his eyebrows and says that he was hoping Neville would assist him with the first part of the operation, and Snape's lip curls as he leaves and shuts the door. Lupin beckons the class to the end of the room, where a wardrobe gives a sudden wobble and bangs off the wall. He tells them that it's nothing to worry about, that it's a boggart in there. Boggarts like dark, enclosed spaces, and this one moved in yesterday, so he thought it would be good practice for his third years. He asks them what a boggart is, and Hermione raises her hand. She says that it's a shapeshifter and can take the shape of whatever it thinks will frighten them most. Professor Lupin praises her and tells them that nobody knows what a boggart looks like when he's alone, but when he lets him out, he will immediately become whatever each of them most fears, which gives them an advantage. He asks Harry if he's spotted it, and Harry correctly says that it's because there are so many of them, it won't know what shape it should be. Lupin tells them about a time he saw a boggart try to choose between coming a flesh-eating slug or a headless corpse, and ended up becoming half of a slug, which wasn't remotely frightening. He then tells them that there's a very simple charm to repel a boggart, but it's laughter that really finishes them off. Lupin teaches them the charm ridiculous, and tells Neville that this is where he comes in. He asks Neville what frightens him most in the world, and gets some laughter when Neville confesses that it's Professor Snape. Lupin thinks and asks Neville about living with his grandma, and what kind of clothes she usually wears. Neville describes a hat with a stuffed vulture, a green dress, a fox fur scarf, and a big red handbag. Lupin tells him to picture those clothes very clearly. When the boggart approaches him, it will assume the form of Professor Snape, and when he says ridiculous, boggart Professor Snape should be forced into his grandmother's clothes. Everyone laughs and the wardrobe again wobbles. Lupin tells the class that if Neville is successful, the boggart will turn his attention to all of them in turn, so they need to figure out what scares them most and how to make it comical. Harry first thinks of Voldemort, but then remembers the Dementor, though he has no idea how to make one less frightening. Lupin asks if everyone is ready and has them back off to give Neville a clear shot. Boggart Professor Snape steps out of the wardrobe, and Neville stutters through saying ridiculous. With a crack like a whip, Snape appears to be standing in front of them in a lace trim dress, swinging a huge crimson handbag. Everyone laughs, and Lupin calls Pravati forward. The Boggart changes into a mummy, which unravels when she says ridiculous. Seamus steps forward, and it becomes a banshee that loses her voice. As each student takes their turn, it becomes a rat that chases its tail, a rattlesnake, and a single bloody eye. Lupin tells them that it's getting confused, and calls Dean forward. It becomes a severed hand that gets trapped in a mousetrap. Ron steps forward, and it becomes a six-feet-tall spider whose legs vanish. It rolls over and over before landing at Harry's feet. He readies himself, but before he can do anything, Lupin steps forward and draws its attention away from Harry. It turns into a silvery-white orb before he says ridiculous, and calls Neville forward again to finish it off. They all get one last view of Snape in a dress before the Boggart explodes. Lupin praises them all and gives everyone five points apiece for tackling the Dementor. Neville gets ten for facing it twice, and he also awards Harry and Hermione five points for answering his questions correctly at the beginning. He assigns them homework summarizing the chapter on Boggarts and dismisses class. Everyone is really excited about the class, except for Harry, who's worried that Lupin deliberately stopped him from facing the Boggart since he passed out on the train. Hermione also wishes she could have faced the Boggart, and Ron wonders if it would have been a piece of homework that only got 9 out of 10 correct. The movie scene starts out with ghosts riding their ghost horses through the window just outside the Great Hall. They then ride through the Great Hall as Pansy Parkinson asks a bandaged-up Draco if his arm hurts terribly. He tells her that it comes and goes, and insists that he was very lucky. According to Madame Pomfrey, another minute or two, and he could have lost his arm. The camera pans to the next table over and up the row, showing Ron, Harry, and Hermione listening into Malfoy's description, as the ghosts continue riding up and down the aisles. Ron is disgusted with how thickly Malfoy is laying it on, and Harry points out that at least Hagrid didn't get fired. Hermione says that Draco's father is furious, and she's sure they haven't heard the end of this. 
Seamus then comes running into the Great Hall with a copy of the Daily Prophet, yelling that Sirius Black has been sighted. Hermione looks at the article and realizes that he was sighted in Dufftown, which isn't too far from Hogwarts. Neville is worried that he's going to come there, and another student thinks it's unlikely, with Dementors at every entrance. But Seamus points out that he's already slipped past the Dementors once. Who's to say he won't do it again? The random boy from Divination says that Black could be anywhere. It's like trying to catch smoke with your bare hands. The camera shifts to a close-up on the photo of a screaming Sirius Black in the Daily Prophet, then zooms into his eyes before transitioning to a scenic view of Hogwarts Castle over the lake, until a Dementor glides by and the flowers frost over. The scene cuts to the third year's reflection showing in a wobbling mirrored wardrobe, and Professor Lupin's voice saying, Intriguing, isn't it? The camera passes through the reflection and into the scene of the third year standing in a group as Lupin asks if anyone would like to venture a guess as to what is inside. Dean Thomas says that's a boggart, that is. Lupin praises him and asks if anyone can tell him what a boggart looks like. Hermione seems to appear from nowhere confusing Ron as she says that no one knows because they are shapeshifters and take the shape of whatever a person fears the most. The wardrobe continues to rattle as Professor Lupin tells the class that a very simple charm exists to repel a boggart. He has them all practice saying ridiculous without their wands. As he has them repeat it, the camera cuts over to Malfoy, who says, This class is ridiculous. Lupin compliments the class but tells them that that's the easy part. That the thing that really finishes a boggart off is laughter. So they need to force it to assume a shape they find truly amusing. He asks for Neville to be a volunteer, and he very nervously steps forward. Lupin asks him what frightens him more than anything, and Neville causes the class to laugh by mumbling that it was Professor Snape. Lupin agrees that Professor Snape frightens all, then mentions how Neville lives with his grandmother. Neville says that he doesn't want it to turn into her either, and Lupin insists that it won't, but tells him to picture her clothes in his mind. Neville starts to describe them, and Lupin tells him they don't need to hear. As long as he sees it, they will. He whispers for Neville to picture Professor Snape in his grandmother's clothes once he opens the wardrobe and tells him to have his wand ready. Still nervous, Neville takes out his wand, and Professor Lupin counts to three before using his own wand to open the wardrobe door. Professor Snape steps out and menacingly strides towards Neville, who points his wand and says, Ridiculous! Snape's black robes transform into a green dress, along with a fox fur scarf, a hat with a vulture on top, and a red handbag. As everyone laughs, Boggart Snape just looks around confused, until Lupin tells the class to form a line. As everyone is shoving into a line, Lupin tells them to all picture what they fear the most and turn it into something funny. He puts on a record player and calls Ron forward as a very jazzy swing song begins playing. Ron steps forward and the boggart Snape turns into a giant spider. As it creeps towards Ron, he pulls his wand out and says ridiculous, causing roller skates to appear on its many legs. As the spider struggles to stand, the class laughs and Lupin calls Bravati forward. The spider boggart changes into a giant cobra and she says ridiculous, causing it to morph into a giant clown jack-in-the-box. Lupin is laughing, saying wonderful, wonderful, as Harry steps up for his turn. The clown jack-in-the-box bogger is bobbing back and forth before it begins to shift into a dementor. Lupin looks worried and lunges between Harry and the bogger. It briefly turns into a full moon behind some clouds before Lupin has the chance to say ridiculous and cause it to turn into a balloon that loses air and flies around the room and back into the wardrobe. He apologizes and ends class there, leaving Harry wondering why Lupin wouldn't let him face the bogger. This section of the movie definitely kept the essence of the book, but it really cut out quite a bit and it did its usual minor detail changes. The book chapter starts out with a bandaged Malfoy showing up late to potions class, acting like a war hero, and milking his injury for all that it's worth. He's getting sympathy from Pansy Parkinson, having Snape make Harry and Ron help prepare his potion ingredients, and even makes mention of the fact that he doesn't think Hagrid's going to be a teacher for much longer. Much of this is alluded to in the movie, which starts out on a transition of ghosts riding their ghost horses and ghosts shattering the window in the corridor outside the Great Hall. And the one looks like he is holding his head, so... Is the headless hunt held at Hogwarts every year? Like, how many headless ghosts do they have up in that bitch? 
I don't know, but Headless Hunt held at Hogwarts was some high-class alliteration. Thanks! But anyways, they ride into it and up the rows of tables. Draco is being, you know, a whiny little bitch, like he is about his arm. And Ron is just staring him down, like, oh, I'll give you something to cry about, you little turd. In the book, Harry tells him to keep talking and he'll give him a real injury, so I think the sentiment is the same. Right? It's face acting. (laughs) In the movie, Harry comments on how it was lucky that Hagrid wasn't fired, and Hermione mentions that she heard Nazi von Douchebag I is pissed, so she doesn't think they've heard the end of it. Yeah, but as there's no potions class... We are completely bilked out of what could have been some amazing Alan Rickman moments. Mm-hmm. As he's a royal dick in this chapter of the book. Facts. Like prince of dicks. <laughs> if you get my drift. Because in addition to making Harry and Ron prep all of Malfoy's shrinking solution ingredients. Which was our trivia question. Ding. Yep. <laughs> but in addition to that, he also completely terrorizes Neville from messing up his shrinking solution. Even tells him that he'll give some to his toad Trevor at the end of class. Then when Hermione speaks up to offer to help him, he criticizes her for showing off. But this moment does completely set up the next section of the chapter, so we'll talk more about it later in the episode. Yep. At this point of the chapter, though, Seamus comes over to Harry and Ron's table to borrow Harry's brass scales and mentions that Sirius Black was sighted not too far away from Hogwarts. Even though the movie cuts all of Potion's class out, it does have Seamus come running into the Great Hall with the Daily Prophet yelling that he's been sighted, he's been sighted. And I just love that only like 11 people even give a shit enough to come and see what the fuck he's talking about. Well, they didn't want to get the wide angle lens out. Obviously. In the movie, they have Hermione mention that he was seen in Dufftown, which isn't too far from there, and Neville worries that he's going to come to Hogwarts. Someone else points out that it's unlikely, with all the Dementors surrounding Hogwarts. But in all his adorable Irishness, Seamus reminds them that he's already gotten past the Dementors once. Then Random Kid says that Black can be anywhere, and I still wish he had a frickin' name. Frickin' Random Kid. He does. It's Bem. That's a terrible name. We just didn't know that then. It's a terrible name. (laughs) Terrible. I also honestly hate this line here. Mm -hmm. It's like trying to catch smoke. It's like trying to catch smoke with your bare hands. Why? Right? Just why? (laughs) Not only was it not in the book, like Bem, of all of the lines they cut, they add this nonsense in? Right? Seriously, I can't with, like, adding and taking out and... It's like trying to catch smoke. With your bare hands. It's like trying to catch smoke with your bare hands. <laughs> what? First off... You can't even. Is it easier to catch smoke with gloved hands? Like, is that easier somehow? Does having bare hands make it more difficult? I don't know how having bare hands would be better for anything. I mean... I feel like the claws would get in the way. Oh, that was so <laughs> bad. That was so bad. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. Just go back to the normal response. I'm being an idiot. Side note, have you noticed how much more diverse the crowd shots are in this movie? Yet another reason to love Alfonso Cuaron. Yeah, that's probably why Bem was added in to begin with. And I did appreciate the more diverse crowd shots. It's even more apparent in the Defense Against the Dark Arts class scene. Right, but at least then we get a gratuitous shot of crazy Gary Oldman. Crazy Gary Oldman. And it's about the craziest, too, with the way he's just so crazy. silently <laughs> screaming and then it zooms into his eyes. Fellow seems a bit unbalanced. That's because he's crazy Gary Oldman. <laughs> and where I can't complain about gratuitous crazy Gary Oldman moments... <laughs> I am really disappointed that we didn't get to see the potions class, especially with how it ended. Mm-hmm. Snape tells them to clean up, let their potions simmer, and then they will test Neville's potion on Trevor. Hermione is muttering instructions to Neville out of the corner of her mouth, so Snape doesn't notice. And then at the end of class, Snape gathers everyone around so they can watch him attempt to make a fool out of Neville. And poison his toad! Dude is so awful here. 
Like I said, we'll talk more about this a bit later on, but you will never hear me actually defend Snape's behavior as a teacher. He has no business being an educator and no business interacting with children, especially ones who clearly trigger his many, many issues. Right. I almost feel like he should have a restraining order put on him. He can't be within 20 feet of any magical school or any school period because no child should have to deal with Snape. I'm sorry. It's terrible. He just needs all of the therapy, too. He really does. But I will say that it goes back to what I was saying about the Dursleys being nothing more than caricatures designed specifically to make us hate them. This is Snape's role at this point. We aren't supposed to see him as anything more than a horrible man and a terrible teacher. Which we do, because he is. He is definitely awful. Because after Trevor reverts to a tadpole rather than dying, he just takes points from Gryffindor via Hermione because he told her not to help. Then, there's another little bit of foreshadowing about the mysteriousness of Hermione's schedule when Ron is complaining to her about the lost points and wondering why she didn't just lie, only to realize she's nowhere to be found. Then, as they reach the top of the staircase, she comes running up at the bottom of the stairs and her bag splits open because she's carrying about a dozen books, even though she only has Defense Against the Dark Arts left that afternoon. The book's foreshadowing about Hermione is far more subtle and way less gaslighting. They do include another bit of it in the next scene, but not until after another classic Alfonso Cuaron transition shot. While unnecessary, I think the transition shot of the Dementors killing and freezing everything they float past is friggin' perfect. I also thought it was a nice touch. I even like that they didn't show you the whole Dementor, just enough that it was clear what glided past, mm -hmm. and then the freezing flowers. Yeah. I also really appreciated the fact that it started out as this completely picturesque shot of the castle and the lake. And it felt like a good reflection of what was happening to the stories in general as they start to become darker. Mm -hmm. It's part of the reason I feel like Alfonso Cuaron grasped the feel of the story the best, even if he did make some really random and unnecessary changes. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, like, sure, we might hate the it's like trying to catch smoke with your bare hands line. But then stuff like this kind of makes up for it. Yeah. You're kind of like, well, that was stupid, but that was really cool. That's what I like about him. <laughs> Agreed. But then the scene cuts to the Defense Against the Dark Arts class with another awesome camera transition as it starts out showing the class in the reflection of the mirror wardrobe and then zooms right through it into the actual classroom. I love that shot, by the way. I think that's a really cool transition. Mm -hmm. And this sort of stays on par with the book chapter, though it does cut out the fact that they arrive at class before Professor Lupin and get all their books and quills out, assuming that they're going to have to take notes. And I still have a hard time buying that's what students do when the teacher isn't in the room. Yeah, and it's usually the movies that like to show that to give Snape a flouncing, billowy entrance in the first movie, and so Lockhart can appendix his way into the second movie. But this movie decided against giving Lupin a grand classroom entrance. Honestly, his entire first class is pretty grand, though, so I think it ultimately makes sense. Yeah. But in the book, Lupin shows up and tells them to put their books away, that all they need is their wands, and then he has them follow him to the staff room. Leaving this out also cuts out a scene with Peeves. Peeves? Peeves. Who's that? We still don't know. Right? Mm. <laughs> but I see it as a humorous way to give Lupin some clout among his students, since Peeves apparently doesn't think he needs to show Lupin any respect and calls him Looney Loopy Lupin. Mm -hmm. I actually always wonder if that's because Peeves remembers him as a student, along with all of the trouble that he, James, Sirius, and Peter must have caused. Like, there's no way that Peeves could come close to considering him a professor or an adult with that in mind. That's true. Maybe he also heard, like, the rumors. You know, I'm sure there were whisperings and stuff when it was decided he was going to come in, mainly by Snape as a teacher, you know? Yeah. It was probably a mixture of all those things, but I gotta say, there's not enough respect for Looney Loopy Lupin, <laughs> because that's some excellent alliteration. Especially with the Loopy Lupin too because not mm -hmm. only do you have the alliteration you have the the p sounds in there yeah there's a word for that and 
you know what? We're just going to keep on rolling. Yeah, I don't know what it is either, so I'm down with that. I know we say this every time Peeves comes up and therefore doesn't come up in the movies, but I'm still so mad that he was cut. It would have been so much fun to see this scene come to life. I know. He's being very Peeves-ish. And he's stuffing gum into a keyhole. And then Mm -hmm. Lupin tells him he better remove it or Filch won't be able to get to his brooms. And Peeves just blows a raspberry at him. (laughs) Yes, thank you for that demonstration. (laughs) No problem. But then Lupin responds by saying, Wadi Wasi, and sending the gum flying up Peeves' left nostril i love the specification there it was his left nostril (laughs) but it would have been amazing to see right i can imagine peeves's face you know like you can imagine like the gum going right up there and just sticking and then him flying off and cursing (sighs) right fun i know the movie also cuts out the fact that once they arrive at the staff room Snape is the only teacher in there, and he uses this encounter as another opportunity to bully Neville, telling Lupin not to trust Longbottom with anything too difficult unless Miss Granger is hissing instructions in his ear. Brood. But I love how Lupin reacts to this. He just raises his eyebrows and in the most diplomatic way possible, says that he was hoping Neville would help him with the first part of the operation. Snape doesn't have anything else to say and his lip just curls as he leaves. Lupin does ask Neville to be the volunteer in the film, too, so there is that. Yeah, but I don't think it has the same effect that it does in the book, since Lupin isn't doing it in defense for Neville, as a way to boost him up after being bullied by a teacher. Yeah, not that we see, at least. The movie just launches right into the class, with the cool transition, a rattling wardrobe, and Lupin saying, Intriguing, isn't it? And asking if anyone knew what it was. And then the one-line wonder strikes again. That's a bulgart, that is. Poor Dean. He totally could have had three <laughs> lines this film, but no. They had to go and make up Bem. Right? Still a terrible name. Then Hermione shows up with a bit more gaslighting, though significantly more subtle this time, as Lupin asks if anyone knows what a bulgart looks like, and she appears out of nowhere to answer the question. Even though she doesn't do the specific, I've been here all this time comment, The look on Ron's face completely says it all. Poor kid must think he's going fucking crazy. Ooh, crazy Rupert Grint. Hmm. Well, it really doesn't have that same ring to it. It really doesn't. No, it doesn't work. This part of the movie annoys me just a little too, because Lupin completely cuts Hermione off mid-answer to finish it for her. Like, it was really clear that she was just completely reciting something she memorized from a book. Which is honestly probably exactly what she was doing. But in the book, Professor Lupin complimented her answer and told her he couldn't have said it better himself. Cutting her off felt a little off character for him. To me. Yeah, I gotta agree. I didn't think of it as as terribly off character at the time. But now thinking back on it, like what, going and watching it now, I'm like, why are you cutting her off? So yeah, I, I see what you're saying there. Also, in the book, Lupin specifically makes it a point to ask Harry a specific question to answer, and we'll talk a little more about why that is in a bit, but after we learn that boggarts are shapeshifters that can take the form of whatever we fear most, he says that gives the class an advantage and asks Harry if he's spotted it. Harry says that because there are so many of them, the boggart won't know which shape to choose. Lupin tells him that's correct and shares a time that he saw a Bogart make that very mistake, trying to decide between being a headless corpse or a flesh-eating slug and ended up going with half of a slug, which isn't (laughs) remotely scary. Disgusting, (laughs) but not scary. Not so much. I really wish they would have included this little bit of the lesson, but I mean, in general, they did kind of change the way the scene played out. But in both, Lupin tells them that a very simple charm can repel a boggart and teaches them ridiculous. And of course, Draco's ridiculous, ridiculous joke is so lame that it actually made sense to be said by him. Right? It's right up there with his training for the ballet comment or scarhead. He's just not clever. Yeah, ridiculous, ridiculous. His smack talk is super weak. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous even. (laughs) But it also didn't happen in the book, (laughs) since the Slytherins were not part of this lesson in the book. But we've already talked about how the movies have a tendency to combine all of the students of that year into one class to fill them up for those scenes. 
Yeah, because there's also Ravenclaws in that class, too, mm-hmm. so there's that. <laughs> in both, he also tells the class that it's really laughter that finishes a boggart off. And it's at this point of the movie that he asks Neville to be his volunteer. And poor Neville must just feel like he's going to get tormented by yet another teacher. Because he has no idea what to expect. Right. You know. Which is part of the reason why I liked it better in the book. That he chose him in defense of Snape's comment. Yeah. Especially since he said that he's sure he will perform it admirably. Oh yeah. I have to agree there. But Lupin's little hello to Neville is so adorable. I just love it. It's like he's trying to make him feel somewhat less scared, but it's just not working. (laughs) Poor Neville. Sounds awkward. (laughs) He's probably again wondering why it's always him, (laughs) expecting he's going to make a fool out of himself in front of his class once more. But despite the slightly different way they got to this part, this is where he brings Neville in to help in the book too. In both, Lupin asks Neville what frightens him more than anything, and Neville says, Professor Snape. Shocker. (laughs) Right. Also, you're not going to be shocked by my love of Lupin's delivery of the line, Professor Snape, yes, frightens all. I love that line. (laughs) It's so Lupin. It's just, and it's like under his breath, and it's, I love it. Sorry. I just love it. (laughs) No, I do love how he said that too. (laughs) But this is where I wanted to bring Snape back up. Because the movies had such a tendency to humanize Snape and remove the caricature aspect of him that really demonstrates just how much he tormented Neville and therefore why Neville actually felt like Snape was the thing he feared more than anything. Mm. Having that scene earlier on where Snape was basically trying to poison his toad really just drove that home and set this scene up. I feel like leaving it out in a way created Neville's fear out of nothing for the movies. Yeah, though in general, Snape is very looming, billowy, and intimidating. So, I mean, it's not far-fetched, because Neville's the Charlie Brown the whole time. Yeah. You know, everything always happens to him. Why me? So, I mean, it would kind of make sense that he's scared of the mean professor. And Alan Rickman really nailed the character and Mm -hmm. his demeanor. But the movies in general just kind of took away the parts of him that were written into the book specifically to make him hated, which also kind of threw us off the scent of what side Snape was actually on. True. He was much more two-dimensional for the majority of the book series, but the film gave him more depth throughout, so it often seems that the same level of hate doesn't exist for Snape for those who saw the movies first. I would totally agree with that, because they cut out more intense scenes where Snape was like straight up just flat mean. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. That was the caricature version of Snape. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. But in both, after Professor Lupin asks Neville about his greatest fear and learns that it's Professor Snape, he then asks Neville about living with his grandma. (laughs) I love how in the movie he says, well, I don't want that bogart to turn into her either. (laughs) I love little (laughs) Neville. It's just so Neville. I love him. He says that in the book, too, but the conversation after is a little bit different because Lupin explains that that wasn't what he meant and asks about the clothes she wears. Mm -hmm. In the book, Neville gives a full description of her tall hat with a stuffed vulture, a green dress, a fox fur scarf, and a big red handbag. Lupin asks him to picture these clothes very clearly and tells him that when the Bogart Professor Snape comes out of the wardrobe, Neville will say ridiculous and the Bogart Snape will be forced into his grandmother's clothes. (laughs) Yeah, in the movie Lupin does ask about her clothes, but specifically tells Neville that he doesn't need to hear about them. If all goes to plan, they will all see them. Which honestly makes sense for the visual aspect of the movie. We don't really need the verbal description when they're just about to physically show us what it looks like anyway. Yeah. So in both, Lupin opens the wardrobe, Professor Snape appears to step out of it, and Neville very nervously says, Ridiculous, as his greatest fear is coming towards him. (laughs) Comes looming, billowing, and intimidatingly towards him. Boggart Snape is perfect! I love it. The vulture on the hat, the handbag, all of it's perfect. It's just... Oh, yeah. Ah! It is a thousand percent what I imagined from the book description. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Neville just looks so proud of himself, and he's so excited because he did it right, and everyone is laughing, but no one's laughing at him. Like, probably for once in his life, really. 
Plus, he found a way to make Snape not as scary. And that's just, that's good for any kid. Right? I'm sorry, that's awesome. And Snape <laughs> was significantly less scary. Though I mm-hmm. do want to add that Alan Rickman was wearing that dress. He was. He could honestly pull off the green lace fox fur. I just love the way the Boggart just stood there confused, looking around as everyone laughed at him, like, what the fuck's so funny, guys? Damn. (laughs) Right? (laughs) It was very similar to the book. Then Lupin calls Parvati forward, and it's from this point that the movie changes and dramatizes things a little more than in the book. What? (gasps) No! Shocking, right? Ah! But the book just has Lupin call each student forward to take their turn, and it's relatively straightforward. In the movie, however, Lupin tells them all to line up to take their turn, and they all shove one another to get in line. Draco, of course, using his injured arm to knock into Neville is possibly the most Draco thing he could do. I had never noticed that before, and (laughs) it's pretty amazing. Very Nazi von Douchebag the second. Right? In the movie, Ron ends up in the front of the line, and Lupin calls him forward as he puts a very jazzy swing song on the record player. Because, I mean, it's always best to fight Boggarts to zingy music, right? Even though that's not how it happened in the book, I love the fact that he put that music on for this scene. (laughs) It really added so much to it. But the movie also condensed down this section of the chapter as well as changed some details. Like I already mentioned, in the book, Parvati was the first one to go after Neville. Her Boggart turned into a mummy that she made unravel. In the movie, Ron goes first after Neville, and it turns into a giant-ass spider that he ridiculouses <laughs> into roller skates. In the book, we do get to see Ron's turn, too, but it's towards the end. It also turns the Bogart into a spider, but instead of roller skates, he makes its legs disappear, and the spider just rolls over and over until it lands in front of Harry, <laughs> who then prepares for his turn. But before that, we see Seamus' turn, which was a banshee that loses her voice. Someone else caused it to turn into a rat that chases its tail. Then there was a rattlesnake, a single bloody eyeball. And then Lupin calls up Dean, and it becomes a severed hand that gets trapped into a mousetrap. That leads it into Ron's turn. In the movie, Lupin calls Pravati forward as the spider bogger tries to stand in roller skates, which I kind of loved. I thought it was pretty damn funny. It was funny. It was definitely more amusing than removing its legs. Yeah. But her bogger does not become a mummy. It becomes a giant ass nope rope. And then when she says ridiculous, it turns into an equally giant ass clown jack in the box. Like, cobra to clown? How is that less scary, Pravati? You're not helping. It's not. It's really, really not. Like, I'm not cool with meeting snakes face-to-face out in the open. Mm -hmm. But I love to look at them in a zoo with super thick glass when I know they can't get at me. Agreed. I'm with you on that. If I never see that clown jack-in-the-box and its creepy-ass grin ever again, it's still too soon. Seriously! What the hell? That's a, that was the worst ridiculous ever. I'm sorry. It just was. Not amusing. I was not amused. No. I was the opposite of amused. <laughs> but it's at this point of the movie that Harry is next in line. Because, you know, let's have a class where everyone will get to see Harry, terrifying childhood Potter's worst fear come to life in front of them. Great idea, Lupin. This couldn't possibly go wrong in any way. You win at teaching. Lucky for him, the bar is low. Like, really low. (laughs) Also, maybe put Harry at the back of the line and not three people in. Just saying. You raise a very good point, but this also is not how it happened in the book. Like I mentioned before, Lupin specifically made it a point to ask Harry a question in the very beginning and make sure he was included in the lesson in some way. He never intended Harry to participate with the actual bogart facing part of the lesson. He specifically was calling each student forward to make sure that Harry never ended up in front of it. It wasn't until Ron's legless spider rolled away and stopped in front of Harry that the situation got a little hairy, if you will. Oh, God damn it! really? <laughs> in the movie, Harry just steps up to take his turn as the creepy fucking clown thing bobs back and forth. Because that's not scary enough. That turned into my friggin' Boggart. <laughs> Lupin, seeing Harry step up to face the Boggart, is like, Wait, wait, oh shit! Oh, oh, damn, maybe I didn't think this through. Ah! Escape, escape, escape! Control, alt, delete! Damn it! <laughs> 
In both, he launches himself between Harry and the Boggart, but again, the movie did it a little differently than in the book. We knew from Harry's inner monologue previously that the Boggart would turn into the Dementor, but Lupin intercepted it before that ever happened. Mm -hmm. Instead, it turned into what was described as a silvery white orb before he says ridiculous and calls Neville back to finish it off. We get one last glimpse of Boggart Snape in his lovely outfit (laughs) before it explodes into tiny wisps of smoke and is gone. Since the movie just has to make it more dramatic and also can't really depict Harry's inner monologue, they just flat out show us the Boggart turning into a Dementor. Which bothers me so much. But it's technically a conversation for the next episode. Yeah, definitely. Lupin jumps in front of the Boggart Dementor and it turns into not a silvery white orb, no. That's way too subtle for the movie. It turns into a super obvious full moon, complete with clouds before Lupin says, ridiculous, turns it into a deflating balloon that flies around the room and back into the wardrobe. He ends the class there, and the camera focuses on Harry's face, who is just standing there with like a, what the fuck, professor, look on his face. And this is where the movie scene ends. The book goes on just a little bit more. Lupin congratulates everyone and awards them five points for Gryffindor, because it was just Gryffindor in class, not everyone. Neville gets 10 points since he faced it twice, and he gives Hermione and Harry each 5 points. Instead of a what the fuck face, Harry just flat out says, but I didn't do anything. And Lupin explains that they each answered his questions correctly at the beginning. Oh, clever Lupin. Clearly better thought out than in the movie. Right? (laughs) Then the class all leaves and talks excitedly about facing the Boggart, as Harry worries that Lupin specifically stopped him from taking his turn, thinking that it must be because he passed out on the train, and Lupin must figure he's too weak to handle it. Poor Harry. Right? That would be really disheartening. Mm Mm-hmm. But then Lavender wonders why Lupin is frightened of crystal balls. (sighs) And that definitely could not have happened in the movie, since there was no mistaking that blatant full moon for anything else. (laughs) Not even a little bit. But then the book chapter ends with Ron declaring that to be the best defense against the dark arts class they have ever had, and Hermione agreeing, but wishing she could have had a turn with the bog art, and I love Ron's response. What would it have been for you? A piece of homework that only got 9 out of 10? <laughs> yep, I love it. And as we learn later, he really wasn't that far off. <laughs> but this brings us to the end of the compare and contrast section of this episode. We really don't have any new actors to say too much about from this scene, since we've pretty much talked about them all. But we can, in fact, mention Genevieve Gaunt as Pansy Parkinson, who gets one line in the opening of this scene. Does it hurt very much, Draco? She did have that very, like, I'm a Slytherin girl, like, emo aspect to her. It was good. It was good. She got replaced later, so we'll talk about the next one later on. Yeah. I remember seeing the promo pictures for her before the movie came out, and I was like, oh, yeah, she looks pretty pansy-like. I was missing the pug nose, though. She doesn't really have the pug nose. But other than that, you know. Yeah. This is also, as we mentioned, where Alfred Enoch gets to say his one line, our little one-line wonder. Mm Mm-hmm. Sweet little Dean. Little Alfie Enoch. Though he should have had more lines. He should have. But we did already kind of talk about him when he walked through the ghost. Yeah. That wasn't so much a line. That was like a... That's not really a line. I said that's a reaction. Yeah. (laughs) That's guy walks through a spider web in the forest. Right. Like, that's all that was. (laughs) Did you see him? He just snapped. (laughs) Satara Shah also had her one word line saying ridiculous and turning a creepy ass nope rope into a creepier ass clown. Which I thought she did very well. She's adorable. Yeah, I don't buy for a second that she was amused by that clown, but that's not on her. Right? But she also gets replaced as Pravati later on, so. Mm-hmm. It's sad. I like, she was adorable. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that clown was just so creepy. So bad. So bad. Other than that, this scene really focused on the characters we've already talked about, or more of a group situation than individuals, so let's move on to this week's Potter Pondering, which is, what would your Boggart be, and how would you make it ridiculous? (laughs) Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. We look forward to reading them. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Emma Homant. 
She writes, Okay, here goes. I am a true Hufflepuff, and I am a fiercely loyal friend. My wand is willow wood with a unicorn hair core, 14 and a half inches, and slightly yielding flexibility. And my Patronus is a dolphin. I can totally see why I was sorted into Hufflepuff. And here's the weird thing. I grew up in a UK naval city, and all the schools I went to were trying to be fancier than they were by separating the classes into houses. We'd compete against each other at sports day, Quidditch much, and earn house points. But here's where it gets spooky. Of the two schools I went to, I was in Carisbrook House, named after a castle, and Intrepid, named after a boat. And guess what color they were? Yellow! Yellow! <laughs> But before anyone gets too excited, it was closer to a training camp for Death Eaters than it was Hogwarts. More's the pity. I got into Harry Potter having first watched The Philosopher's Stone at the cinema when I was at university. I was totally hooked and rushed out to get the books ASAP. I think at that stage there were four books out. I read them back to back and I'm pretty sure I skipped some classes to get another chapter or two in. I'm rereading the books again at the moment and watch the films about five times a year. I find the films really comforting and they really help if I'm feeling stressed or anxious. I also collect Harry Potter and Fantastic Beasts enamel pins. I'm married to a Gryffindor who looks like a long lost bearded Weasley and luckily he is just as Harry Potter obsessed as I am. I've been really upset by the growing stream of intolerance and ignorance that J.K. Rowling keeps spewing out. It's difficult to square her Twitter persona with the woman who created this amazing, inclusive universe we all love. Yeah, we've stopped following her on Twitter. Mm. I'm grateful that she gave us these stories, especially since they led to us starting this podcast and meeting so many new and amazing people, but I can't condone what she says. I just figure that with everything else crazy that's happened this year, she's been taken over by a pod person. I gotta agree with you, or at least I hope that's the case, because I just, I don't want to, I can't with her anymore <laughs> and you know what harry potter belongs to the fandom now and really it always did let's be honest she may have created it but it wouldn't have become anything without all of us there is so much more to this world than just what she put on paper exactly thank you for sharing your sorting hat story with us emma we're so happy to have you as a keeper definitely and if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, the wood, core, and length, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might like to share with us. You can also share it on the post pinned at the top of our Facebook page at JKR Podcast if that's easier for you. That will bring us to this week's trivia question, which is... What was the name of Lavender's rabbit that was killed by a fox? The prize for the first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag October 16 will get a bitch is a witch, my fucker's a wizard, a just keep rolling, that's not how it happened in the book, that's not how it happened in the movie, or a pride sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us. If you're an Apple person, you can do that through the Apple Podcast or iTunes app. If you don't have Apple, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can now also subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we will be posting our weekly episodes, blooper reels, other random videos, and soon, our Just Keep Rolling cooking show! I'm so excited about this. <laughs> I know. We will also be moving into our recording studio this weekend, and we'll be sharing a video tour of it as soon as we are settled. So we didn't get to record this one in the studio like we hoped, but hopefully the next one. We also have several other goals in place to keep bringing you more content. So if you'd like to support us as a patron to help us get those going, and for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. You can also go to our website at justkeeprolling.com to check out our Just Keep Rolling and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 8, Flight of the Fat Lady, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. 
We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just keep rolling. Thank you.